Welcome to the Birds and the Bees podcast. This is Braxton Dutson. That's the key. People aren't talking about it. Everybody needs to know that porn is not a documentary. It's not like if we don't talk to kids about sex and sexuality, they're not going to hear about it. They're just not going to hear about it from us. They have tons of questions. They just don't know how to ask them. All you have to do is be one chapter ahead. You don't have to know everything. Mm. Just one chapter ahead of wherever your child is. Hey everyone, this is Braxton Dutson. Welcome to Birds and Bees Podcast. So glad to be with you hive mates once again. If this is your first time, welcome to the show. And if you're a longtime listener, thanks so much for your continued support and being with me once again on this amazing journey of learning how to talk about sexual health and improving your relationships. This interview is all about pornography and talking to your kids about the dreaded naked people on the computer and sexual activity that they're going to come across at some point in time. You know what? Some people ask, what do I say? How do I even bring this up with them? Is there an age that's too soon? And if I bring it up with them, are they just going to start looking for it sooner? How do I address questions that kids may have and what happens if they really don't want me to bring it up? These questions and many more are going to come up in this episode with Kath Hackinson. She is a sex educator from Australia and has worked in the nursing industry, has done so much work when it comes to sexual health, and actually is the creator of sexedrescue.com and is a wonderful resource, especially if you're thinking of having the conversation about pornography with your kids or even just sexual health. She covers all sorts of topics in her blog and with the books that she reviews. So I thought I'd bring her on Birds and Bees podcast because I've had many parents asking me, hey, when do we start this talk? What are we supposed to do? We need a, an educational podcast about talking about pornography with our kids from little ages all the way through the teens and into adulthood. Today we're going to be covering a, how to talk to your kids about pornography. What about parental controls? Maybe ways ways to use parental controls, and what to do if your child's already seen pornography, when to start talking about it, as well as when you talk to your kids, what else do you tell them and how do you keep the conversation going? This isn't a one and done. So I'm really excited to get you this information and to have you all start talking to each other as as uh, parental units, as well as how you start talking to your kids about this, because this needs to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's when, and you'll hear us talk about that in the episode. Thank you so much for your ongoing support for Birds and Bees podcast. If you find this episode supportive or you find it helpful, please consider sharing this with your friends and also consider donating to Birds and Bees podcast. We've got a Venmo. It's just at Braxton Dutson. It's at B-R-A-X-T-O-N-D-U-T-S-O-N. Any little bit helps fund to be able to get them more often as well as be able to get the equipment needed to keep this podcast at high quality. So if you can throw any amount of money into donations to keep Birds and Bees podcasts going, I'd really appreciate it. Also, continue to share with your friends. That keeps the, the hive alive and it also keeps the conversation buzz going. So we really appreciate everything that you are doing just in listening and, and anything that you can do to support the podcast. Thank you so much. We're really excited to get started into this. So without further ado, let's hop into the conversation I had with Kath Hackinson on Birds and Bees Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Hey everybody, welcome to Birds and Bees Podcast. This is Braxton Dutson, and today I have a really special guest. We have Kath. And Kath, I um, I don't know exactly how to say your last name. Tell me Uh, about that. Hackinson. Hackinson. So (laughs) Kath Hackinson is with me today, and we are talking about the one of probably the number one question I get for Birds and Bees Podcast, as well as a sex therapist, and it is about pornography and kids and how to have this conversation. So thanks so much for being with me, Kath. Hi, Braxton. Thanks. So the one of the things that I'm really excited about talking about today is essentially we're going to be going over some of the ways to start up the conversation, how parental controls work, is porn harmful, and uh, what to do if, if your child's already seen pornography or maybe you haven't talked about this quite yet and 
you don't know how to start the conversation, maybe you have an older child instead of a younger child, and we're going to cover all those things today. So I am so excited to get into it. First off, I'm curious, Kath, tell me a little bit about your history. You've, you've got quite the extensive history on sexual health and, and working with people. Tell me about it. Yeah, so I've got a nursing background. So I've been talking to people about sex for about 25, 26, 27 years now. So for basically for almost from the start of my nursing career. So I did my nurses training and then I ended up in a part of Australia which was a little different, um, right in the very, very centre around Ayers Rock, and it's where our Indigenous population is. And I started what you call bush nursing because the money was really good and it was really interesting work. But it was back in the days where we were really worried that HIV would hit our Indigenous communities and wipe them out. So they were throwing a heap of money at sexual health. And so because I was a female and I had a vagina and a vulva, I was expected to do sexual health screening. Wow. And I got thrown in the deep end. I, you know, I'd never done, I'd never held a speculum. I'd never looked, you know, I'd probably, you know, I had looked at vulvas and vaginas before in, in the hospital setting, but I was just thrown in the deep end. And I loved it. I found I enjoyed talking about sex. And I found that I was actually good at the talking part. And I was really good at making the women feel comfortable. So I went off and did some training and found that it was just an area that, I don't know, I think as a nurse, we just have an art of getting people comfortable. And I don't know what happens where you live, but it live, but in Australia, they do this big survey every year of the 10 most trusted professions. Nurses are always number one or number two. Wow. And I found that people were happy to tell me stuff that they wouldn't normally tell their doctor or someone else. So I worked in sexual health, I worked in women's health stuff, worked in prisons and did clinical drug trials. I got bored really quickly and easily with stuff. So I just kept, I did research, I did everything. And then I did sex therapy for, I loved that. And I thought, this is it. I have finally found what's made me happy because I did what I called meat and three veg sex therapy. So it was the everyday stuff. I didn't get the fetishes and the kinky stuff. I got the normal, the stuff that Mm -hmm. either may or break a relationship. And then I had kids mm -hmm. and everything changed. I'd walk into the lounge room and my three-year-old be sitting on the lounge with a hand down a pants or at a dinner table with people over mm -hmm. masturbating. And it was like, my God, what do I do? Yeah. I could talk to a client about their sexual pain and what was happening in their bedroom, but I'd walk into my own house and see my own daughter and it pushed buttons for me. Absolutely. And I'd yeah. So I then started thinking, okay, sex education, this is something I need to do. Because having worked as a sex therapist, I knew looking at the different clients, and you would know this yourself, that different clients come in and they have totally different backgrounds. And what happened in their own childhood in regards to how their parents talked about sexuality and how they learned about sexuality has a huge impact on the decisions they make as adults. Yeah. And I found that the adults that came in and just needed a little bit of help, a little bit of a push in the right direction, they usually had healthy Sex education, they, were, they didn't grow up with a lot of shame. But then I'd get the people that grew, grew up with lots of negative messages and it you know, created so many future problems for their relationships. So I knew that sex education was important, but I didn't know what I had to do. And I would read this stuff and I'd go, talk to your kid about, you know, a vagina's a vagina and a penis is a penis. And I'd be like, yeah, okay, but how do I do that? You know, tell me what to do. Yes. Don't just tell me this, tell me that I have to do it. Tell me how to do it. Mm -hmm. So I got really frustrated with all this what I call crap out there mm -hmm. that just wasn't helpful. So then I thought, I need to do something about it. So I canned the sex therapy because it was just getting too hard to do everything <laughs> yeah. and decided to set up Sex Ed Rescue, which was all about helping parents to find a better way. And what's really interesting is my sex therapy and all that stuff that I've done, you know, going from one area to the other, mm -hmm. I'm applying it every day now to what I do and it's great. Absolutely. Um, so I find I tend to get a lot of parents who find sex education hard tend to follow me. Um, so there must be something that I'm doing to help them get more comfortable with 
Six it. I would say that that is the truth. And that's how I actually um, was first introduced to you. And I was thinking back on how did I... How did I meet Kath? Someone asked me, like, you're interviewing someone from Australia? How did you even meet how did you even meet Kath? And I was like, oh man, I I cannot remember how I came across Sex Ed Rescue. I don't know if it was from Twitter. Somewhere through the lines I found Sex Ed Rescue mm-hmm. and I started following your um your your emails as well as the blog that you're on. And I was like, man, I have to have her on Birds and Bees podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Because the, the the resources that you give is just, I mean, you've got books, you've got recommended books to for kids at certain ages. You're constantly br- putting out great content, and so if you if you are interested, I'd head over to sexedrescue.com and just browse. There's so much to, the, so much support that you can gain just from this one website that Kath's been. Uh, been putting together. Um, when did you end up starting that? How long has that been? Oh, I gave up full time work because I sat down with my husband, 2015. Okay. And I said to him, I either have to give up on this or I have to put everything into it. So we sat there and made the financial decision. We no longer have holidays. Yeah. Kids definitely will not be going to private schools. <laughs> <laughs> but I am so much happier. Yeah, so this is my fifth year. And fifth oh, year. definitely, it's. T- I think it's taken me that long to get clear about what I actually do. Oh, that is mm. one, that's, that's great. And it's all part of that process, right? It's all part Ooh, of the process. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of processes, I think that's exactly what we're going to be talking today. And when we're saying, how do we talk to your kids about pornography? Not just sex, but we're talking about naked people in your iPod, your, the things that they can run across. And that same question that you just came up with, how do I have this conversation about my child who's got her hand down her pants, let alone this uh, conversation with what they might be seeing online. What are what are some of the things that uh, that you see these parents get hung up on the most? The ones that are following you. What do they What do they tend to go? Ah, Kath, I don't know how to start this. What do I even ask? Yeah, a lot of parents struggle with actually starting the conversation. I get two types of parents. I get the ones whose kids are already seeing it um, and they don't know how to respond Mm. and they don't know what to do about it. And then I get the parents who want to be proactive and actually they hear the stories from the other parents whose kids have already watching it and they know they sort of know they've got to have the conversation but they just don't know how to start it because we're not talking about loving baby making sex we're talking about sex that can be not very nice Mm -hmm. yeah definitely we're we're talking about (laughs) all yeah the whole spectrum you can run into so many things if it's especially because we're typically talking about pornography that is found on uh, a website that's free and it is just uh, it is no holds bar you can run into whatever right Mm. what are what are some of the things that uh, that you encourage parents to do in in bringing up the conversation? Well, I guess the first thing is um, some parents, first of all, haven't even talked to their kids yet about sex. So if you've got the sort of relationship where you're not talking about sexuality, you're not talking about penises at the dining room table, if you're not having conversations about where babies come from, you're not talking about dating and loving someone and other conversations like that, it can be really hard to then throw yourself into a conversation about porn yeah but then again talking about porn you don't always have to talk about sex because this is the thing I read something from one of my peers and she was saying that if you're going to talk to your kids about porn you've got to talk about sex first and I thought well yes and no because You can talk to a three- or a four-year-old about porn. You can talk to them and say, because, look, you go to the shopping centre, how many kids do you see sitting there on mum's phone while she's shopping at the checkout? And I'll tell you what, if apps had been around on phones when my kids were little and you're lying up in the long queue and the kids are hungry, I would have had my kids on a phone too playing a game. Absolutely. So So you need to be able to say to little ones, oh, sometimes you might see videos of people with no clothes on if that happens to put you need to bring it give mum the phone straight away or something as simple as that you don't need to tell them what they're doing if a kid sees something or adults sounding like they're hurting each other because sex 
you know, if yeah. you didn't know what was going on. I've got a friend who used to think that her neighbours were fighting in the evenings and she was a sex educator. And then <laughs> one night, every Saturday night, she'd hear this and one day she got so curious, she got the ladder, led over the neighbour's back fence and they were watching porn. <laughs> <laughs> she laughed because as she said, she says, I'm a sex educator. I know about this stuff. She didn't realise it was sex they were watching or the sort of porn they were watching. Wow. So to kids, it doesn't sound like sex. It yeah, sounds it's like content. someone's getting murdered. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the noises that can happen with sex. So to kids, you can have a conversation with little ones about Porn, mm -hmm. but you're not actually talking about sex and this is the whole thing I think that when we're talking to kids about porn we see it we focus on porn whereas a conversation really should be about if you find something online that upsets you so all those videos where they were doing pranks do you remember those a couple of years ago yeah yeah pranking videos and they would scare people and people would get hurt mm -hmm. and people were it was just going crazy on YouTube. A lot of those videos upset kids. Yeah. So conversations with kids that if you see something, you know, you might see a beheading. There were all these horrible um, five years ago, yes. horrible beheading videos from the Middle East when, yeah, all yeah. this stuff was going on. So it's conversations about anything that you see that upsets you. And then you can also talk about the fact that if it's people in, no clothing or sexy mm -hmm. clothing. Like my son, so many times he's come up to me and said, Mum, Mum, I've seen porn. I've got, oh, have you? Come and <laughs> what did you see? And he'll show me something. It will be a girl in a bikini. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, phew, it's safe. But the thing is, is he felt safe doing that. He yes. felt that he heard the message and would tell me when he saw stuff. Well, and, and I like that you that you brought up that there's two parts there. That one, you were having the conversation, he felt comfortable. The second part is the first question that came out of your mouth was, oh, have you? Like, you've seen pornography? What did you see? That first question, the curiosity. Well, what did you see? And if you would have responded with some of the parents that I work with, or typically that were like, oh, my son just saw porn. That means that he's a porn addict. And I probably need to call my you know, religious leader. I need to do this. I've got a sex fiend on my hands and I don't know what to do. And, and he saw someone in a bikini, but he heard, he's like, this is porn. That, that curiosity clears up so much stuff, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I, and I love that that's, uh, that's one thing to, to bring up that curiosity aspect of it. And the other things that I, that was sticking out to me on what you might say is just starting out at, uh, if you can, if you have the opportunity, your children are young, talk to them about sexual health. Like we're using penis, vulva, vagina, talk about these, uh, these body parts and be able to use them mostly for your own benefit so that you can learn to say them without maybe like being like, oh, this is way too embarrassing or but you're just having another conversation. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to throw yourself in the deep end without knowing how to swim. So yes. sometimes knowing how to swim or how to stay afloat. And you can also prep yourself for the conversation. You might go, okay, there's been, I've heard all these stories about the kids streaming porn at school. There's a good chance that little Johnny's been shown it as well, yeah. but we haven't talked about anything. So, okay, how about my goal is to work towards a conversation about that in a couple of weeks, but let's talk about some other things first. Mm -hmm. And, you, yeah, there's ways you... I don't know if you know that saying, but beating around the bush, yeah. where you go to a conversation in a very indirect, roundabout way. Mm -hmm. And you might have a couple of, um, you might talk about something that you heard on the radio first before you actually get to the conversation of, have your friends showed you any of this? Have you seen it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And how many ways around the bush can you <clears throat> can you go? We've got uh, music videos and we've got TV shows and movies and I mean, we could go down the list of anything that starts beating around the bush of pornography and sexual health or yep. sexual um, conquests or whatever you want to bring in because it is everywhere. It is everywhere. Oh, sex education. Talking to kids about sex is so easy nowadays because there's opportunities thrown at us all the time. Mm -hmm. Listen to the radio in the car. Um, turn the TV on. Bus goes past with someone in sexy lingerie. Go food shopping. This, you know, I've got a sex shop a block away. <laughs> <laughs> so there's opportunities everywhere. There's no shortage of excuses to talk. So I think 
think today it's much easier for us to talk about this stuff because we do live in an over-sexualised world. So rather than sit here and go, poor me, how do I keep my kids safe? Turn it to your own advantage. And yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Do do you think that there's an age where maybe the the child's too young to talk about pornography? Or is there a specific age that you recommend or think would be a good time to start? Oh, I think, now I'm in the process of writing this all up into levels at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think that you can very gently talk about it up to about the age of five, six or seven. So, for example, my son, he's now 11. Mm -hmm. And I first started talking to him about pornography about three, four years ago because I had a friend who wrote a book and she said, Kath, have you talked yet? And it's like... No. (laughs) So we had conversations, but a year ago we were driving and we were sitting at a traffic light and there was a sex shop across the road. I live in the inner city. (laughs) Um, And there was a sign out the front and he said, Mum, what's P-O-R-N spell? I said, P-O-R-N. I said, porn. He said, what's porn? Luckily, it was a red light. I stopped and I looked at him, you know, bad parenting mother. I said, what? I said, what? You don't know what porn is? I said, what? We've we've talked about this so many times. Porn, are you for real? You don't know what porn is? He looked at me and said, no, what is it? (laughs) I said, you know, naked people having sex, people with no clothes on, the sort of stuff that you might find on YouTube and if you do, you're supposed to tell me. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what that is. Oh, yeah, I remember. (laughs) But I was sort of like, you know, kids, they forget stuff. And so it's a conversation that you have to keep on having. But I think you can talk at about that age of five or six because you're talking about if they find people with no clothes on Mm -hmm. or people... Yeah, or people in sexy clothing. And if you're also talking about it with, as images that make you feel different or feel mm. funny or make you feel scared or excited or just different, yeah. something that makes – because this is conversations. And this whole thing, I've got a friend who works in um, with – protective behaviours, protective education, Mm -hmm. and she talks about how she went to a big cyber thing in Australia. It was like some big guru came from England and he turned around to them all and said, you're all stupid. He said, you're all talking about um, cyber safety as if it should be its own niche. It's its own sort of area of expertise. He said, it's protective behaviours. He said, you should be thinking of cyber safety and pornography as in how do we keep children safe? Not as in talking to them about a particular issue and a particular Mm. sort of area of conversations. Mm -hmm. He said, it's a conversations of talking to kids about if you feel scared, what does your body tell you? Mm. Um, Getting them to understand their inner warning signals, making sure that they've got someone they can talk to if they feel safe. So when you look at preventing child sexual abuse, a lot of that stuff fits in with pornography because grooming and pedophiles as well with sexual abuse will groom children with Mm -hmm. pornography as well before they abuse them themselves. And that uh, I like that you're bringing this up. That maybe it's not so much the the question of what is the exact age I should start this, but I love the idea of around the age of five, especially because that's about the time that we're going to start having them go off and play with friends, and yes. they start to yes. leave parents side if you will yes it's how it's the environment that you have so if you're homeschooling and you have no internet access and you live in the middle of nowhere and your kids aren't playing with other kids I don't think you need to have that conversation then but if they're going to grandma's and grandma doesn't have you know um just lets them sit on the internet and do whatever they want um, or she has visitors and stuff. You need to have different conversations then depending on what your kids are exposed to. Yeah, and then I love the the fact that we're talking about pornography being so – the the term does not have a, a def, definite definition, if you will. So it's like, well, what's pornography? Well, even as we're describing it here where we're specifically talking about people engaging in sexual acts, being naked – something that is that is meant to arouse sexually that is something that even as though your your son came up and said i saw porn that that possibly could be something that was distressing to him um, and then being able to have that one or that two way conversation while also checking in cuz some kids won't check in with you others will be very open with checking in and so being able to uh, to start feeling out what your kid is more exp- what what they like to do more are they more one that will hold things in and not talk? Are they one that are very expressive and want to talk about what feelings they have? And how do you read your child that way? 
Yeah. And this is where it comes down to the relationship that you have with your child. Yeah. It's not, if you've got the sort of relation, what you need is a relationship where your kids feel comfortable talking to you. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing about sex education is if you if you can talk to your kids about sex, it means that you can talk to them about anything, but more importantly, they can talk to you because yes. kids pick up that sex is a taboo topic. So my daughter's 14 and she knows that the conversations we have at our dinner table are not conversations that any of her friends have. <laughs> and... Um, so it's interesting. So she knows that she can come and talk to me about stuff, and she does. Now, she does not always. So great example, when she had her first period, she didn't tell me for three days. Wow. And we have a very open and honest relationship. Mm -hmm. So she had supplies. She wasn't stressed or anything, but she felt uncomfortable about telling me, mm -hmm. despite the fact that we talk about all this other stuff. <laughs> so this is that great example of, you know, even though you might have an open and honest conversation, kids won't always feel comfortable talking to you about stuff. Yeah. And the porn is one of those conversations as well that I might say to my son, if you see something like that, tell me. I also have to remind him that he's not going to get in trouble. He's not going to lose his internet access because if he thought that was going to happen, there's no, no way, way. to tell me. It's like cutting off their oxygen supply. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. It's pretty important <laughs> like thanks for telling um, me now you can't hang out with friends or play yeah. games oh <laughs> yeah so we need to sort of make it easier and as they get older we then need to take on that responsibility for checking um mm -hmm. and it is hard yeah. like i'm lucky i've got a 14 year old who likes dobbing on a younger brother so <laughs> <laughs> So I've, I've got her watching as well. But I've actually installed software monitoring stuff now. Um, I don't mind you. I have to go in and check if it's still working because my son's 10, nearly 11, mm -hmm. and, you know, one night we're crawling into bed my husband said, oh, he had his had the iPad for some reason. He said, oh, how to kiss girls. <laughs> he said to me, oh, is there something you should tell me? And it's like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my son had started to. So he's getting to that age now where he's starting to get curious. There so it is. We have, co have to have conversations that if you want to know anything about how to kiss girls, come and ask me about it. Don't look it up on the internet because, and this is how most kids find stuff, curiosity. Yes. And it doesn't matter how many conversations you have, how open and honest your relationship is, kids will still be kids and mm -hmm. they'll still do what kids do, which is why we've got to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're in, a, in an age where Google is accessible anywhere. And you can't hold that back from your child, <clears throat> not just because you can't, but like there's, you literally don't have the access to, to cut off all areas. Even yeah. if you have the best, even if you don't have a computer in your home, they're going to have access to it somewhere. Yeah. And I'm learning something here the most, or like I say this all the time to my clients because I'll, I'll be talking to them about this and like, oh, you must do it perfectly. Or when you, I wish I knew everything that you knew. And I'm here in Kath, you you and I, we know this, and you've got kids that you're, you've worked with on this, and they're still looking at Google. They still feel uncomfortable from times to talk with you about that. And that's just how, that's how growing works, is how do I feel comfortable? How do I not? And so yeah. we can't take this personally in a way of, how are we going to do this perfect? We can't do this perfect because every child's different. And when every child's different, all we can do is say, this is what seems to work. I'm going to keep talking to you about it. And when something comes up, how is my reaction going to be? Can I keep calm? Yes. <laughs> can I get curious? All those things are so important because mm -hmm. the, just like what you did where you're saying, well, tell me about what you saw. And I'm not going to freak out over this, even though I don't know what to do right now. And maybe we need and to change. Thing, yeah. And you don't always have to respond straight away. Um, you know, you don't have to give that instant reaction. It's not like, you know, you see a kid riding a bike off the side of the bridge and there's no barrier and they've got no brakes. It's not like you have to intervene and respond straight away. Mm -hmm. um, you've always got that time to calm down. Yeah. And we, you can always do damage control. Yes. Um, a big believer in that, that if you have responded negatively, you can fix that up. Kids learn more, I think, from when we stuff up as parents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they learn more because, you know, sex education, it's part, everything we do is parenting. It's all about getting our kids ready 
preparing them so that they'll leave home and have successful lives. Yeah. And when they see us stuff up and they see us apologise or make amends, they learn a lot from that as well. They learn, grow up understanding that they don't have to be perfect themselves. Yeah. yeah. And I think that uh, I like your analogy of they're not they're not going off a cliff on a bike that needs action right now, and there's one right way to do something. That oh um, yeah yeah. And look, porn is I have from like talking to lots and lots of parents and talking with people who specialise with working with children who are, uh, have usually ended up in the eyes of the police and they've got to come along and have um, therapy and treatment because of what they've been up to. Um, Talking to them and from what parents and I've seen myself is the kids that end up having problems with porn are the kids whose parents don't know about it mm. or their parents don't do anything about it. The kids that have got parents that jump in and respond and have got open, you know, good relationships, they're the kids that don't have problems. Mm -hmm. um, I often say that I see sexual development as a path and there's like a main path and sometimes we go off the path mm -hmm. but nine times out of ten with a little bit of conversation the kids will get back onto that path yeah. but occasionally they don't get back on their path and they get a little bit lost and then you need to get someone to come in and help you get them back on yeah but um I, that's what i just believe and i just believe yes uh, and the ones that end up off the path they're the ones that do stuff that's Gets them in prison. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then that's what <laughs> End we're up talking. With sexual problems, and mm -hmm. but there's a lot of really good research. The UK, in particular, does some fantastic research that looks at how teenagers deal with porn, and it's not all doom and gloom. They're not. We think kids are stupid. We yeah. think that that they're going to look at this stuff, and they're not always going to believe that it's what happens, mm -hmm. um, that it's, yeah. So I think there's some good research coming out saying that teenagers can look at stuff objectively and go, oh, I don't think, you know, I don't really think that's what happens or that's yes. not what I want to do with my partner. There's a pocket of them that do believe that, but mm -hmm. then you've got to look at what else, you know, it's the bigger picture. Yes. What else is that child narrow-minded about? When we look at research and we hear these horror stories, we're only seeing one small snippet of the story. We're not seeing the bigger picture and mm -hmm. the other stuff that happens as well. So I think as parents, you know, porn is pretty serious and I don't want my kids growing up on a diet of porn, mm -hmm. but if the, when and if they do see porn, well, not if because it's a matter of when, when. Yeah. It, by talking to our kids, we're giving them the skills and the knowledge to be able to manage porn appropriately, to be able to make good decisions about whether they want to watch it or not. Yeah, that it's involves like, you, you know? in, instilling your values, which is why it can feel like they're falling off a cliff on a bike because it's typically not the values yeah. that are that are there for the parent. Yeah. And then we're also looking at it going – when the, this research that we're talking about, uh, there's been some fascinating research, I want to say over in Ohio, um, that uh, there was, there, they, they had a group of kids that uh, they were teaching about sexual health in pornography. They, they talked specific about pornography and started saying, this is what sex is. This is what um, female bodied individuals typically um, like. This is what male bodies typically look like. This is how actions are. This is kind of how sex works. And they, they talked to them or they had a screening pre the education and then post and you're right they followed right along with that the first part is they're like i don't think so but i'm seeing so many people engage in this type of sexual act online and so i must need a penis that's this big or every girl really wants this or every every homosexual relationship really wants this or that and they're oh. they're putting it together and going i don't have any other context because no one taught me more so it's becoming education when they get yeah. education about it, then they look at it and it almost becomes hysterical. They're like, that is not what they want. That is, okay, yeah, sure, touching touching this girl on her neck isn't going to make her make those sounds so much. Maybe some people, but for the majority, it's okay if my girlfriend or my boyfriend does not act this way because I know that this is entertainment versus a peek into someone's room that I'm yeah. all excited to see because now I know how to have sex. And I think that's super important is they will pick that up, but they have to have the education. We have to talk to them or else porn becomes the education and we don't want that. Yes. And we've got to talk about this stuff because kids are picking up messages from everywhere and we can't tell a kid what values to grow up with. So if you want your kids to wait until they're married to have sex, 
you can share that information with them, but you can't force it. You know, days mm-hmm. of chastity belts are over. Well, <laughs> hopefully they're not over for everyone. Some places still do have them. Yes. But you can't force them. But all we can do is guide them and talk about stuff. And how the hell can we expect our kids to make a decision about pornography if we're not talking about it or to make decisions about love, sex relationships, if there's no conversations, if there's no baseline? Mm-hmm. Because a lot of us, as we grew up, we didn't have parents ourselves to talk about. So where did we get our sexual values from? What mm. we saw on TV, what we read in books, what our friends were up to. And so many of us made mistakes ourselves. So if we don't want our kids to make those same mistakes, we need to talk. And as a parent, I, I worry about the partners that my kids are going to have one day. Yeah. Um, because... I don't want my daughter's first relationships to be with someone who learnt everything they know about sex from porn. Yeah, exactly. And I don't want my son treating his partners how people get treated in porn either. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's pulling out your values of saying, I want, I want relationships to be uh, supportive and a sexual relationship to be caring and to be able to, to have them know that they can expect and demand certain things from a sexual relationship that it's not something you have to, I think that's the number one thing that I hear most people report of like, well, guys typically want this or girls typically want this, or I saw this. And so I figured I was just supposed to go along with it. Mm -hmm. And that is probably one of the things that, that makes me the most sad is that there, that takes the consent out of it. It takes the consent out of a sexual experience because whether they're having sex after marriage or beforehand, or they're following the values of the family, or they're not, or they're be, they're creating their own. If you're if you're not bringing consent into it, some of that education, especially from porn, is more of like, well, if you don't want to, I just have to convince you more. Or yeah. if you don't like this, I just need to wait, and uh, you know, then then eventually you're going to want this because that's just what I saw, and that's the education I've had. And I think if we have this conversation especially when we're talking to them about you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. If you don't think you want it, don't say yes. And if you have a trusted partner and you want to try something, let them know beforehand. Talk to them. Say, hey, this is something I'd be interested in doing. This is something I'd want to. Or this is something I want to do only after I'm married or only after I've been in a relationship for a couple years. And they get to then start creating that decision for themselves on what they want their relationship to look like no matter what they've seen in pornography or what their partner's seen in pornography, it can take that out of the equation, more or less. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What are some of the things that you think we ought to, um, we're talking about this conversation. I wonder if we can break it down a little bit more into what would we tell, um, what, what would we tell a kid if, uh, if we're bringing it up maybe for the first time? We, we're a parent that is listening to this podcast following sex ed rescue and goes, Oh, I have a 14 year old too. And I've never talked about this. In fact, we've only had a talk about her period and, or the son, you know, my, my, my son about masturbation or, or maybe we talked about periods, but we haven't talked about anything. We've given one talk. What should I do about talking about pornography? They've probably already seen it. You can often use the excuse of, I heard something on the radio the other day. Uh, I saw something on TV, I read something in a magazine and it talked about how teenagers are learning about sex from porn and it made me sit and think and realise that we actually don't talk about sex, we don't talk about porn and it made me think about why and my parents didn't talk to me about it therefore I haven't felt comfortable talking to you. Um, I feel, unco- you know, I feel uncomfortable now talking to you. This is something that we don't talk about, but I'd like to change that. I'd like, you know, I'd like us to be able to talk about this stuff more um, and maybe lead it from that. Sometimes wow. you can take the easy way out, way out and grab a book. <laughs> books. I, and this is why I love books. This is why I started reviewing them all um, <laughs> because they make sex education so easy. Want to talk to your kid about porn? It's a choice of about six or seven good books. You can go, you know, in with the fairy tales. <laughs> you can <laughs> yes. slip in a book about porn or <laughs> consent, whatever you want. I used to do a deal with my kids.
kids and I'd go, you can pick two books, I pick one book. And we'd read a book and we'd read the book um, and they might ask a question. First time you read it, I always just read it Mm -hmm. and then wait and see what happens. And then I might pull the book out again a week later and I might ask a question. But you can take it very slowly and books are great because you don't have to remember what to say. You don't have to have a post-it note of (laughs) porn is this, um, (laughs) the what, why, how, when, how, because Mm -hmm. the book says it all for you. Yes. And then you could slowly, as you get more comfortable, and realise that there's a hole's not going to open up in the earth and you're not going to fall into it by reading this book. Mm-hmm. Um, you can then start asking questions or have you seen this sort of stuff on the internet? And there's some really good books starting to come out. Yes. And books like this are good because you need to buy them because mm-hmm. you need to keep revisiting them. It's not the sort of book that you can borrow from the library. It's a book that you need to have sitting in your bookcase. Yes. Yeah. Most definitely okay. mm. and, and you've got uh, you've got a lot of those on on uh, um, sex yeah. and rescue yeah there's about a dozen porn ones someone is sending me a book to look at about sexting which I got wow. so excited about um, she messaged me today to ask if it had arrived and it's like uh, no apparently you, there's a heap of mail sitting in um, mm-hmm. postal warehouses in Australia yes. at the moment <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping so a book on sexting oh, so I'm so really important. keen to see what that's like so important um, so there's more and more stuff coming out mm-hmm. for you're, starting conversations what you're talking about Kath is making me like I'm seriously feeling warm inside I'm like when you started talking about how um, how to bring up that conversation with a teen or someone that you're like oh, I'm behind the 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 ball on this one and just being brutally honest this has been uncomfortable for me this is something I don't know how to yeah. do and I feel it's really mm. important and just being real and saying this is this is what's going on and this is kind of the values I have. I think typically parents feel the need to jump in and say, uh, kind of in a demanding way, you will not look at porn. You will tell me if this happens. And just as much as we've seen that work super well with teens, right? You're going to do this. <laughs> and, yeah, and the teenagers not. go, watch me not do that. And then we get into a battle of wits or a battle of uh, will. And the way that you describe that, I think teens are really good at also recognizing reality and emotion. And if you're being real and saying, you know what, I know that you've probably already experienced this. I want to talk about it. I want to have this conversation keep going. It's difficult for me. Wow, you're teaching him so much more than I don't want you looking at pornography. You're teaching him everything about this is uncomfortable and parents are uncomfortable, Mm. just like what you're saying. And you have those. This is just one of many conversations. Teenagers, you're talking about, I don't want you going in a car with someone who's been drinking. I don't want you using the phone as you drive. I don't want you coming back home on the bus at midnight. Mm -hmm. Um, There's so many conversations that we have with kids and it comes down to your parenting style as well Mm -hmm. um, as to how you parent. So it's about fitting it in with your style. But as you've said, if you're going to come down heavy with teenagers who are finding their own independence but they still need you there to catch them and guide them mm-hmm. um yeah it all comes down to your style yeah. and but that's why i'm that big believer in open and honest relationships they're just so important mm-hmm. to have that and you can be as firm or as lenient as you want but if you're talking and you're communicating and your child trusts you and they know that you've got their back mm-hmm. It's just a good starting point. Yeah, it's definitely that balance between is the is the parent a friend or is the parent the the ruler that needs to be there? Oh, like, we, yeah. we've got to have that balance of like you can come approach me and I'm also going to hold firm boundaries and you can push the boundaries, but I'm also going to push back and these are the yep. values I'm going to teach. It, there's very much a balance to it that yeah. needs to play in with your teenager as well as your parenting style, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, and I get very analytical. I look at the people around me that I know, different family members, different friends, and I look at how they talk to their kids about stuff and I look at the directions that their kids go to and I've got lots of sex friends in, you know, sexologists or sex educators or therapists and I look at where their kids end up and the decisions that they make and you see that evidence of those people that have those 
great conversations with their kids, their kids grow up making usually smart decisions. Mm -hmm. We all make bad decisions, but their kids bounce back from those bad ones as well. Yes. And I look at the other friends who might not be talking about sex or they might be talking about other things or they want to be a best friend to their kid rather than being a parent mm -hmm. um, and just see the directions that their kids end up and the writing's on the wall. Mm -hmm. You can just see it. And having worked with um, adults and teens yeah. for a long time, <laughs> you, you just, the writing's on the wall. You can just predict where someone's going. Absolutely. <laughs> Based on what's it ha happening at home. Mm -hmm. And and it all, there's, there's those differences, uh, as you're saying, like with smart decisions and bad decisions, we have healthy decisions when it comes to the physical body. And then even though maybe because I, I, we're in Salt Lake City or I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah, <clears throat> which is a, a place where we, we have a lot of individuals that really value um, not exploring sexual experiences before marriage. And the, mm -hmm. when those values are really heavy, we're just saying like maybe more orthodox individuals that, uh, that are a part of a religion that's more orthodox and says, this is what yeah. you're supposed to do. Uh, the, the not talking doesn't encourage the value following. It's just there's not – we don't see that in research. We don't see that anecdotally. There's no way to, to be able to say, if we don't talk about sex, then my child will not engage in sexual experiences. What we're actually seeing is we talk about sex. We instill our values and talk about those values. We also talk about sexual health. And all three of those will help create the decisions that your teen wants to make, that you want your teen to make, and then be able to help them build that resiliency to uh, to come back if they start to come off of that path a little bit. But we have to have the conversation. Yeah. Can't make smart decisions based on ignorance, can yeah. you? <laughs> oh, I have to quote it's... you on that. <laughs> Can't make smart decisions based on ignorance. I love no, that. Well, you can't. Yeah. yeah. It's like having an operation. You know, will I have, you know, will I have this major surgery which could change my whole life? Um, to, you need to, to make a decision like that. You need to have information. You can't just go, yeah, I'll do it or no. It's, yeah, we just fear that if by talking to your kids about porn that, you're going to create a problem. So I started writing all this stuff and I'd be, I was doing all this research and finding out, getting all the evidence to back up what I wanted to put mm. because there's not a lot out there to actually say what we should be doing. And a lot of what I do is based on common sense, understanding of how kids learn and experience sexuality and a yeah. little bit of experience but I, I was writing all this stuff and I was starting to talk to my son a lot more about porn and I had that moment where I thought maybe I should be talking to him by talking to him about this stuff maybe he's going to go and google it he's going to, you know maybe I'm planting the seed what's mum going on about all the time maybe I should go and look it up <laughs> and then I thought hang on get real this is not what's going to happen and I had to sort of remind myself and it's funny like I know all the barriers I know all the fears but they keep coming up mm -hmm. um yeah it's just and it doesn't matter who you are here I am with all the knowledge all the research talk to my kids about stuff all the time and I'm still getting fears about what's it going to do mm -hmm. conversation yeah. Am I going to create a problem? Am I going um, to create it? That one comes up all the time that the parents, when I'm talking about this, they have this jump and they're like, I'm going to do it. But what if I start talking about breasts and bodies and people being naked and then that's going to push them? Am I going to push my seven-year-old to go look at naked people having sex? Yeah, because talking prepares them. It makes them more resilient rather than I remember one night, um, this is when I was doing some research, about five years ago I found this really good website by someone and it was for parents about how to have the porn talk. Mm -hmm. I think it was called the, oh, I'll tell you the web night, you'll find what I found. I think it was called the porntalk.com or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I found a piece of paper somewhere in my huge 
pile of photocopied things that had the website domain. So I plugged it in and next thing on the screen was this huge photo of these guys having sex, a video. And I thought, and it was like this, oh, wasn't what I expected to see. Mm -hmm. And and I was shocked, first of all, that that appeared because I was expecting a black screen because the website was black with white. Mm -hmm. And it shocked me. Yeah. And then I had a bit of a look because I wanted to see what was there, <laughs> just out of curiosity. <laughs> and my husband was sitting next to me and happened to glance over and said, oh, are we bored, are we? <laughs> and it's like, no. And then I told him. And, um, yeah, and it was just like it was that initial shock. But I knew what I was looking at. But how would my kids feel um, if they, because I sometimes will be looking for something and porn will pop up. Mm -hmm. But I'm an adult. I know that what I see and I recognise it and I know how to respond. So if we don't talk to our kids, how are they going to feel when they see this stuff and they don't know how to respond? They can't recognise the feeling that their body's responding to. So having these conversations makes them a little bit more resilient. It prepares them. Definitely. Um, so that they know what to do when they see it. Well, there's probably um, a lot of uh, parents that are listening to us talk right now going, yeah, I was one that didn't get spoken to. And and when I saw uh, pornography for the first time, I did experience a lot of that <gasps> kind of the immediate shock and then maybe bodily reactions where the body's responding to sexually relevant content. And then I don't know if I should be looking at this, but I'm also intrigued and there's curiosity and all these different uh, experiences that come up and you haven't had any context for it. So I love that us talking about that can help curb that reaction. And at the same time, I think this there's a there's a combo in here that we're talking about. You were talking a little bit about uh, having parental controls and that the Aww. parental controls popped up. And from the parental controls, you could see that your son or someone was wondering how to Ooh. how to kiss girls, which is a, you know, obviously a very curious thing for a, a, a preteen to be wondering. Um, but being able to see that with the conversation, there's protection where you can also follow up. Yeah, they. I have always been anti-software blocking, first mm-hmm. of all, because it made my job working from home and even... When I was working, I, you know, I installed it when my kids were younger. I couldn't look up anything on the mm. computer for work because I'm looking up sex stuff all the time. Um, so I've always been anti it because it made my life harder. But also, <laughs> B, I actually felt that I saw it so often that parents would go, oh, well, I've got software. I've got parental controls. Mm-hmm. My kid's fine. It's like, oh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Until little Johnny lends them his phone and says, hey, look at this, or they go to grandma and grandma does nothing Mm -hmm. with the computer um so I was always against it but then my kids got older um and I've got a super curious little boy Mm -hmm. and I then realized that I actually needed to put up some soft something to make it harder to keep it to make it to make it hard safer for him but also it's what it is is about delaying it because I know it's going to happen but I don't want him to be exposed to porn now Mm -hmm. because um, I don't know whether he would tell me. Um, He's just at that funny age where so for us we have it. My kids know about it so we had a big conversation about it because it makes their life a little bit harder. Um, But for us what was really good was about it was it actually helped us start start having conversations again about pornography Mm. um and because my kids wanted to know how it worked and we had to do a little bit of testing Mm. um so I was looking up porn on Instagram on my daughter's Instagram account which she wasn't very happy about (laughs) (laughs) trying to see what I could find because I wanted to know what it would or wouldn't let me do um so yeah really interesting brought up some great conversations um by installing it but um 
the common thing that I see with parents is that it's like I have parental controls, therefore I don't need to talk. Yeah. Conversations do still need to happen because parental controls are a pain. Like I'll, I'm going to go in after our chat just to check that ours are still up. Mm-hmm. I get a report every day. I instantly delete it. I don't even look at it. Mm-hmm. I do get a notification if someone's looking up porn mm-hmm. um, because, okay, yeah, so it does let me know if something yeah. Yeah. I there was a, there's one quote from one of your your blogs that I really liked where it says you find that it doesn't just block pornography it also blocks conversations. Yeah. And I think that's what we have to take from this the most is parental controls yeah they can be annoying they can be great the main thing is it makes it harder. I have not heard one story of someone coming into my office and saying you know what, um, I was looking at this and then I was curious and then my parents got parental controls and for the next five or six years, I just, I didn't see pornography at all. That never happens. What happens is they got parental controls, we stopped talking about it and then um, I would find this on Instagram or if I would type this and misspell it just a little bit, the, it, the software wouldn't read it up and so when it wouldn't read that, then it wouldn't ping it and then I could see some things and there's always a way around it and there's al- there's always a way around it. So the conversation is the the first step the software can be the second step and then continue to check up is the third step in that but don't it's not a crutch to rely on yeah and if kids are watching porn they often find it hard to stop watching it and that's where parental controls can be really helpful as well because it just makes it that little bit harder for them but again you still need to be having those conversations as well and um we're, lo- we're looking at, uh, like you said earlier, we're looking at them as, as healthy adults, as adults that we want with, with a positive sexual experience. Once they're 18 yeah. and they leave your home and they are not paying for their own parental controls, <laughs> we, we want to teach them ways to be able to help manage stress, anxiousness, yeah. boredom, uh, desire for sex, masturbation, things along those lines. Because if it's like, well, we held you out till 18, now go off and do your own thing, and they don't yeah. have, know how to manage it, then we're, we're dealing with the same thing. There's so many adults that have porn addictions who aren't able to have healthy relationships with someone. And this is the thing as well. I do a YouTube channel for tweens. I've stopped doing it lately because um, I turned off all the comments because it was just getting too hard to moderate them and I felt there were a few Mm -hmm. adults that were potentially grooming some of these younger viewers, so I just stopped all comments. Mm -hmm. Um, But a lot of them were watching a lot of porn and they were finding that it was the only way they'd masturbate. They would masturbate daily to porn. Mm-hmm. They had, they were incapable of having a relationship with someone or didn't want to or felt that having a girlfriend or a boyfriend was too hard. It was just easier to watch porn. Yeah. And it was tricky because it was sort of like having to come up with a reason why they shouldn't. It's like if I could if my son could have McDonald's every night for dinner, he would. He'd <laughs> love it. He, but So trying to get the message across to him as to why McDonald's every night isn't a good idea. And you've got to come up with reasons that make sense to them. Yeah. Um, you know, do you want to be a famous soccer player one day? Yeah. Well, don't eat McDonald's every night. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so, and it's the same thing with porn. Do you want to have a relationship with someone one day? One day? Do you want to meet Mr. Right or Mrs. Right? I'm not big into fairy tales and mm-hmm. believing that there's one person out there. But yeah. hey, if you're talking to a 12 year old or a 14 year old, you spin them whatever you yarn you want to spin them Mm -hmm. to get the message across to them and for a lot of kids they want to meet someone they want to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend they want to feel loved they don't want to feel alone as an adult Mm -hmm. Um, so talking to them about if you want to have a good relationship with someone one day well you need to be able to connect with someone and being a what you know watching porn every day is going to stop that from happening and that can be something that uh, again we look at it in a way of um it's parts to relationships and we can talk about that especially when it comes to pornography being simple it's inviting mm-hmm. it's uh no one's ever judgmental and so there's there tends to be less stress than being naked with another person oh, that's definitely look, a thing to talk about you know you stick some porn on watch it within 10 minutes you've you've 
you know, you're sexually aroused, you've climaxed, you had your orgasm and you're back off to washing, washing the dishes or whatever. Mm-hmm. But to have sex with a partner in a bedroom can take up to half an hour or an hour. That's if you're actually talking to each other or like each other at the time. Initiating. Or he's in the mood or you're in the mood. Porn's easy, um, especially if you're feeling horny. It's the easy solution. But... It doesn't do much for a relationship. <laughs> doesn't it's not about connection. It's very much about one thing, getting your own rocks off, you know? It's about your own sexual pleasure. And there's and that's there's yeah. one thing as you're talking about that. I'm I'm reading the book Boys and Sex, as well as if you read the gr- Girls and Sex by uh, mm. Peggy Ornstein, I believe is the author. And in Boys and Sex, they are talking about how how these boys were um, experiencing, especially that what we're talking about right now is typically when porn is seen as the go-to and we're not talking about it. And they think their relationship should be like this. And they're avoiding relationships because they're so worried about penis size or squirting or breast size or how they're supposed to moan and act and all these things. So it's like, ah, I just won't do this. And I will, I'll, I'll look at the pornography instead. And when education came in, they were able to start bringing that back in. It's not a death sentence for a relationship. It's just, let's bring it back to what, uh, what we have for values in relationships and, and connection. We can all yeah. talk about this as parents. My daughter's 14. And most of the conversations we have lately are about love. They're about relationships. They're about consent. We don't talk about sex a lot. We talk about all the other stuff that makes a relationship up. So I'm getting lots of converse questions from her about when when I met her dad, how did I know I loved him? Um, how did how come we're still together, but all her you know some of her friends' parents are divorced? So the conversations we're having now are about love and relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, the sex stuff she finds, you know, she can go read it in a book. <laughs> <laughs> when you um, say you'll throw a book at her sometimes and yeah, say to go. <laughs> yeah. But we're now having conversations about all these other things that are just as important and it's about the big picture. It's, it's the whole package. It's not just about one small part it's like yeah your meal at mcdonald's you don't just get a burger Mm -hmm. you get fries and the shake and all the other stuff and i think we need to let kids understand that relationships are about the whole thing they're not Mm -hmm. just one small thing and sex is just such a small part of a relationship it's an important part but it's a small part absolutely I'm I'm gonna ask you one more question, and I'm I ask everyone this is like if if you could the the takeaway the thing that if you, you could tell all the listeners here one thing that you want them to have um, or that you want them to take away from this episode, uh, what would that be? And I'm gonna follow or bring that up as as I'm I'm taking away um, my aspect of it. One thing I'm pulling from this is that formal conversations aren't necessarily the best. Just one talk or once every couple months talk is not going to get us into the place that we want. But if you're starting to talk at age five and then you're going up into age, you know, through the ages and it continues to progress and we keep them as casual conversations and we're talking about it a lot, you're doing yourself a lot of favors when we get to some of those more difficult teen years. And we just have conversations about what we see, bring it up, talk about it, be uncomfortable, seek support. That's what I'm learning from everything that we talked about is you can do this. You just need to yep. do it. What, what would you say yeah. you want the, the listeners to take away? It would be that the first conversation is the hardest. And I see this in my parent group. I do a free Facebook group for parents and some of them will come on and they'll go, I had my first conversation with the, my kid about X and it was so much easier than I thought it would be. And this is the thing is that, the first conversation is always the hardest conversation, mm. but once you've sort of had it, it then does get a lot easier. And I think that's that thing. It's don't put it off because once it's happened, it's done. <laughs> nice. And then and you it can keeps talk going. More. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kath, for being on here to talk about such an important topic. I really appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks, Braxton. It was a good talk. We it was a good about talk. Some stuff. <laughs> we we <laughs> did have a good talk, and it all. And we hope that you take all parts of this and be able to start uh, your own conversations. Again, thank you so much for tuning into Birds and Bees podcast and uh, for supporting 
the uh, the buzz, keeping the buzz alive, talking to your kids about sexual health, talking to your partner about sexual health. That is what we're here for. So we look forward to seeing you in future episodes, and we appreciate you being a part of the hive. This has been another episode of the Birds and Bees podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions about the show, comments, or questions you would like addressed in another episode, please give us a call at 385-449-1818. Leave your voicemail and your question, or you can also email us at birdsandbeespodcast at gmail.com, or visit us online at birdsandbeespodcast.com. <laughs>